Welcome back to the Prada Museum. We're here a few minutes before the museum opens with our weekly session in English on the Prado social media programming. This is a project supported by American Friends of the Prado Museum, and we are dedicated to supporting the Prado and its programming, along very much with our sister organization in Spain, the Fundación Amigos del Museo de Prado. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for helping us. Today we are in the antesala in Spanish, the entry room of the main gallery upstairs, it's so impressive, where we have this gallery that is dedicated to the allegory in art, the unification of the Spanish Habsburgs' great faith and defense of the Catholic faith, how they're both united. We have welcoming us here Charles V. And Charles V is such an important character in European history with so many countries calling him as their own in that he was first the Duke of Burgundy, then he was the first king to rule as King of Spain, unite under the United Kingdoms of Aragon and Castile. And from these inherited territories, he was also elected Holy Roman Emperor, Emperor over the German Austrian uh, area. So this is a vast, vast territory. And he is known as Charles V and also Charles I of Spain. It's the same figure. And as we come in, we have a really impressive, enormous painting by his favorite artist, which is Titian, Venetian painter Titian, and whose artworks fill the Prado, thanks to the great passion that uh, Charles and his sister Mary of Hungary and his son Philip II uh, would have to this painter. And the painting that enters, as we see, is called The Glory. And I chose this painting because it really um, just have a review of its context, because I think it helps us a lot appreciate uh, what it is, and it's really personal. It takes on a personal significance uh, for the emperor. What we have is an image of the Trinity and glory. And the textual reference for this are the works of St. Augustine, the city of God, where the blessed are seeing a vision of celestial glory, a trinity, the, the Father, the, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the Dove. And the whole composition is ascendant and works to this. And we know that Charles commissioned this work and gave very specific instructions to Titian. He commissioned it uh, in, the 15, in 1550 or 1551. And for an idea, this is just two or three years after the great Charles V on horseback after the Battle of Mulberg, which is just a few meters down the hall. Um, so it's very contemporary. And, the, and it breaks away from other images of the Trinity. And so we know that Charles gave the painter very specific instructions as to what he wanted. Also very important to know that this painting, Charles would abdicate from the throne and he would retire to a very remote and beautiful uh, monastery, but very far away and difficult to reach, especially at that time with the roads. And the area of Uste, this is in the area of Extremadura in Spain, and that's where he would retire from all of his political life and live a very religious uh, moment preparing for death. And he took this painting with him and actually asked to see it uh, very close to his death. So he, we know it was a very personal painting for him. What we see is, apart from the celestial, we have Jesus and God the Father, very similar, and very, it's very similar figures both dressed in blue, and in the center, the dove of the Holy Spirit. And with this golden 
uh, haze and lighting around them of glory. They are, has a very interesting idea that the other figure in blue is the Virgin Mary. And she is the only one who is not looking up in awe of the Holy Trinity in this beautiful moment, this impressive moment. She is dressed in blue as the Father and the Son, and she is looking down uh, at the figures. But she is a great intercessor. She and John the Baptist are great intercessors uh, for people uh, to, reach, to reach their prayers, to reach Jesus and to God. Below them are figures from the Bible, both the Old and the New Testament, that we have Moses here, the big monumental figure of Moses with the tablets of the Ten Commandments. Right behind him, we have Noah and his ark with the dove showing that the that land has been found. We have King David over here in this blue um, robe with Armenia and his musical instrument, you know, because he was a musician also. And these figures above them, this is where it becomes very personal. We have the portrait of the royal family. So we have Charles himself, Charles here, with no longer his crown on, his crown is down below his knee, and he's companion in the company of his wife, who is already deceased at this time, Isabella of Portugal, and his son, Philip, his daughter, Juana, and the two, his two sisters, Maria and Leonor. So this is the imperial family, the holy family. They're not dressed in rich clothing, they're dressed in shrouds, prepared for, preparing for death. They're barefoot. They are praying to the Trinity. They are in hoping, praying for their intercession so that their souls will be eternally saved. Now, all of this idea and ascension and this presence of glory is very important, even though it's very small down here at the bottom, there is a landscape that brings us back kind of to uh, an idea of the real, of our reality, with these figures down here, which are kind of witnesses of this celestial glory happening. These witnesses that are surprised, we believe that they're pilgrims, uh, and they are surprised with this monumental uh, happening, occurrence, and it very much is the connection between our reality and the spiritual reality. Very interesting also is that uh, other people allowed to put, put themselves into this painting, not only the imperial family, according to uh, Charles's wishes as to who was there, but also a self-portrait of Titian. Titian says, well, me too. I want to come in with you <laughs> to, be in, to have the Virgin Mary and John the Baptist intercede for me in the eternal saving of my soul and his friend Aretino, who is a great writer and his publicist. And even beyond that, we also know that the ambassador uh, to Venice, the Spanish or the imperial ambassador to Venice said, well, if you don't mind, will you also include my self-portrait? And, and we'll all get in there, you know, behind the lead of, of the Emperor Charles. So very, very much faithful in this sense. Um, another, another idea is also a kind of a political statement. Right at this time, Charles and his brother Fernando, Ferdinand, who is the uh, inheritor for the imperial crown, have a family rift over succession rights. Uh, Charles would like for after Fernando, Ferdinand, for his son Philip to come in, and Ferdinand wants his son Maximilian. So there's a little bit of a family rift over that, and they are absent in the family pleading uh, for their eternal salvation. Other, and then one last thing to bring it together uh, is Titian signed this painting 
We're going to have this another monumental figure here. And this one is in doubt whether I've read it was John the Evangelist, and I've also read that it's Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is the prophet of, who speaks about the last judgment. But on this scroll is where Titian signs his name. So just knowing that this is the painting that Charles gave specific instruction as to how he wanted painted, changed the iconography a little bit of the of the Trinity and the scene and how to include the imperial family in this very humble way without, um, without ostentation, just very humble souls praying for their salvation. And that he took this with him to his retirement in Uste and wanted to see it before he passed away. I think it adds a lot of context that helps us appreciate this painting. So thank you very much to, for joining us today, and we will see you again in our next uh, session.